This is Financial Standard, the definitive source of news, thought leadership and analysis for Australian wealth management professionals. Financial Standard. Take the lead. I'm Cassandra Baldini with Financial Standard. Recently, I spoke to this year's recipient of the AFA's Female Excellence in Advice Award, Amy Baker. We discussed the importance of financial literacy for women and their role in the advice sector going forward. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Amy, to talk about your recent award that you won at the AFA Conference, the Female Excellence in Advice Award. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. In your speech at the gala dinner, you said um, winning the award meant so much to you and you recounted the first conference you ever attended. You said you looked up at the women on stage and you said, I want to be like that. So can you tell me a, a bit about why winning that particular award was so important to you? Um, actually, it wasn't a conference. It was a, a, an event at uh, the Dalton House, I had those road shows I remember going to, and it was, I think it was Deborah Kent that I saw speaking. And um, she's become, you know, a friend and a mentor over the years as well and has encouraged me to step into the roles that I'm in now, so a- along with many other amazing women. But when I started out, um, especially once you're in your own business, you're being female is already isolating when you go to PD days, being often the only woman in the room, maybe apart from the um, BDN that's invited you. But it going to an event where you start seeing that you're not the only woman in the room and that there's other women that are standing up and actually in roles of leadership, it can be encouraging. But also, uh, I don't know, there's something that just excites me, (laughs) excited me about that at that time was just like, wow, we're really now moving forward. Um, It's sort of something that I remember just looking at and feeling really positive about having these great women doing things before me and and really paving the way. You shared a post um, online and you said that women represent 20% of financial advisors across Australia. You added that encouraging more women into the profession is important. I mean, why do you believe financial advice is an ideal career path for women? And what are the perceived barriers? I mean, why aren't more women taking it up? Why aren't women taking it up? I cannot give you the answer to, um, really, honestly. I think it's, I believe people really don't understand what we do. So I think we've really got to be more, uh, we, we've got to sort of spread the word in our in our own social platforms as advisors to sort of the more media, mainstream media about how we help people, the win stories, the goals keep people actually achieve because they're under advice. I mean, statistically, they say people who are under advice, 80% of them are less financially stressed because they're seeking advice. But um, and I feel that more women should be in the profession because women relate to women differently to how they relate to men. And I do not want to, you know, uh, discredit the great work that, uh, you know, our male colleagues do because they're doing fantastic work as well. But uh, what I what I see in just with in my world and the women that come and seek advice from me is that they want to they want to feel connected in that sort of more of an emotional sense. Women do communicate differently and more and more women are starting to seek advice and I feel more women need to. We've got a big problem. We've got a gender wealth gap issue. Women take time out of work, lose a lot of money out in super because of, you know, maternity leave and whatnot. There's a there's a whole range of issues. Women often are only working part-time because they're looking after children. Um, there's There's a lot of factors that we need to address. And I think as a woman in advice and one who's already been there, I've had kids, uh, you know, I've been divorced. I've gone through those life-changing experiences. I, my clients can completely relate with me and I can ple- completely relate to them. And there's a, a different emotional setting and communication that we have that I don't think men really get because they've not walked in our shoes. What is it like working in a sector that's so heavily dominated by males? Um, Look, it's changed over the years and I've been very fortunate to have some great, great male mentors and friends in the industry that really want to see more of us, more women in the industry that that really want to, you know, see this positive change and see the good things that we're doing. Earlier in the day, you know, I've had some not-so-great experiences there's just been sort of an old school culture 
that I have experienced and I know of other women who have also, but I don't really want to focus on the negative because it's no longer, it's it's changed. There has been so much positive change in our industry and we've, we've kind of become very, uh, I guess, flexible as, as a profession because we've not only dealt with changes when it comes to uh, legislation and the way we actually operate our businesses, but we've also changed cult in our culture. And something I, I experienced, and I know I'm not alone, is having that culture within an organisation like the AFA and the FPA where you're part of a group, you're part of a movement, and you're sort of, it's a bit like being part of a big extended family. And seeing that actually shift and grow to where you're being looked after and, um, and mentored is fantastic. And that's what I want other people to come into this profession to experience. Before you touched on the gender wealth gap and um, the ATO recently said that as of August 2022, in Australia, the, gate, the wage gap for full-time employees is 14.1%. I mean, there's recent data that's also been shared around um, women having higher levels of financial illiteracy than men. Um, and the number mm -hmm. of homeless women over the age of 55 is expected to double in less than a decade. So, just going mm. off that, you know, what can or should be done to better inform women and increase their financial literacy? I'm so glad you asked that. Well, I'm actually in the process of doing a beta launch and I've got a whole group of students in my launch on financial literacy that I'm taking to market. And part of that is anyone who purchases the course actually contributing to an organisation called the Equanimity Project, which is trying to prevent women's homelessness, but also helping women who are fleeing from domestic violence. I'm very passionate about this issue. Um, it's heartbreaking to see that the, but that it's actually women in their 50s that are facing homelessness. Women give a lot of their power away when they get into relationships, um, into marriage, when it comes to their finances. And financial illiteracy is a big problem. I feel it really needs to be taught at schools. It's it's sort of like who is responsible for this, you know, who's responsible to teach this? Uh, I believe advisors definitely have a, a key part to play in this and I've made a, a very clear choice in what I want to do in my business and how I deliver that to the public. And I feel that we all do, as advisors, educate our clients, but the problem is not everyone can afford to come to see financial advisors. So how are we going to bridge that gap? And I think it's also great to see that there are a lot of advisors putting information out there. There's podcasts, there's, you know, Instagram posts. There's a lot of information that people can get. The issue is I feel that people don't know where to start or what to look for. So it's again now working with organisations and seeing where you can help. And that's sort of what I'm at the moment doing. So I've got the Equanimity Project and we're going to be doing a big fundraiser next year. But it, they, those ladies that go through their program can actually access my course. And then also that those who go through my course that are paying full fees they are contributing to helping these women. So I'm trying to find ways we can, uh, you know, really help in this area. And I, what I'm doing is really small in comparison to what we could all be doing. And I think there's a massive, massive issue. And I think we, we all need to be addressing the elephant in the room. And that is a big problem with our financial literacy. And this gender wealth gap needs to be sorted out. And there are a lot of things that we need to be looking at when it comes to government, when it comes to education, um, you know, I believe that we've got, I mean, I could go on this rant, so you've No, please, keep going. <laughs> you've, 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 you've even found Doris box for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's so much that can be done. Uh, we've really got to start talking about it. The more we talk about it, the better, you know, the more things are going to get done. It's that old saying, you know, the, the squeaky wheel will get oiled. As if we can all start actually either putting more stuff out in social media, not worrying about how perfect it looks, just starting to encourage people to make a difference. The other thing that I do is also address the fact that why do we get where we're at? Like I mentioned, women often give away their power and we've got to understand why. what's our mindset, what's our sub subconscious programming and why society's kind of created this as well and address the cultural issues to why we're here. That is so interesting and true. And I love that you said women give away their power because you're absolutely right. There's all this time out of the workplace and, you know, some women don't return and that's obviously going to damage super and that's obviously going to damage your understanding in, around financial literacy. We know that there is, you know, an underinsured um, issue going on in Australia at the moment and people are not a 
people are being priced out of advice. And I think that it does definitely, you know, it impacts, it impacts everyone, but it does seem to impact women a lot more. And those statistics around, you know, women sort of being the fastest approaching cohort to, you know, to head towards homelessness is a bit, you know, it's a bit scary. So there is a lot that needs to be done on that. Uh, absolutely. I think we, we've we got to address also the education system. I was, when I was interviewing a, a bunch of ladies at the Equanimity Project a couple of months ago, one of them was a student studying law. And she said, she's just, you know, she was, a, I think she's in her early 20s. And so her schooling is very memorable at that point. And she was like, the only uh, piece of information we know about superannuation is if you were in the maths in practice, which is the lowest level of maths that you would learn about um, super and how to budget, but the higher subjects didn't even cover that. And that's a big problem as well, as well I think. The, the other thing I've got to also think to talk about is that there's a lack of confidence in many women, especially if they've come out of relationships where they've been told they're no good at stuff, that they've got this sort of, you know, deep-seated belief that they're hopeless with money. They may have even been told as children, you know, that you, you know, one day you're going to grow up and you're going to get married and you're going to have a family. And, and all these things are very subconsciously driving us and the decisions we make. And often many women will come out of relationships and be single parents like I was. Uh, I, I was fortunate to know how the mechanics of money and how money worked and I could manage a budget. But often these women don't think they know what, how to manage money and they've got this story they're telling themselves that they're hopeless with money. Yet I can tell you they're keeping everyone fed and the roof over their head and they're probably doing it on a very tight, tight budget. And it's surprising because they are the ones that are terrified to move forward but they're the ones who actually have the ability to do so much more because they know how to run a tight budget. They know what to do with their money and how to and tell their money where to go. It's just that they don't know where else and what else to do with it. You're so right. And that's a big key part to this as well, the missing links on how to manage money. It's so interesting because women actually, data does suggest that women are better financial planners and make smarter financial decisions. So it's such a strange gap. I think you're absolutely right. What's missing in the middle is that understanding or what else there is and not having the availability to, to receive financial advice perhaps is, you know, something that is, is the easiest place to start um, to really inform more women um, on the subject. Yeah, look, I there's, there's a lot of platforms out there that are really working hard to create sort of like a fintech space where that it's more affordable, but I think there's a need to have that connection and contact with a person. The issue we've got is this affordability. Um, I, I created my course because I want to actually ex- get more people, you know, to access this information, information that I've learned over 18 years in finance that I feel I, I'm not giving you advice, but these are the tools advisors use. This is how I calculate how someone, how much someone's going to have in, in retirement. And there's mindset stuff there too. And I think, as I said earlier, I'm doing my part, but I'm sure that there are a lot of other amazing people that are doing great things. In fact, yesterday um, I bumped into Kenna Campbell, who's who does Sugar Mama TV, a lot of financial literacy stuff, and she's doing great things. So if we can all just try and find our own space in a platform where we're offering things to the greater community and working with charities and doing things like that, I think if we all start thinking bigger, thinking, you know, one to many, not just the one-on-one advice approach, but really starting to pivot on how we operate our businesses, we can reach more people. And I also believe that we've got to start looking and talking to these, you know, to governments and speaking to our local MPs and really making change that way because that's that's all also got to be, you know, done. Education needs to be changed. The policies around um, paid maternity leave and the mm. fact that super's not paid. Mm. Super needs to be considered. Absolutely. And it's a matter of how's it going to get funded. Small businesses won't be able to fund it. I know I'm a small business and I go, how would I be able to do that? Sure. But if there's government grants or something, I mean, there's money, there's money being poured in other directions that I don't feel is actually going to be sustainable for our people, for people to grow, and that's going to be our growing our economy. You know, so there's so much there we've got to consider. 
And I guess that does call to having more females in the advice sector. I mean, what what would you say to um, young women out there who are thinking about moving towards that as a career option? If they love to help people, they want to connect and they like to connect, then this would be the absolute best profession. We get to solve problems. We get to see people thrive and strive and actually kick and achieve goals. Uh, We're there, the good, the bad, the ugly, But it is certainly a true vocation. I don't believe it's just a career choice. It's something that chooses you. And once you've got it in your heart, it's hard to walk away from, you know. We've gone, you look at all those amazing advisors that have gone before us and are coming through. And we've had so many changes and so many challenges, but most of us stick around because we love what we do. And this satisfaction is really about helping people and solving problems and seeing them really thrive. I mean, money's simply the tool And we're just showing them how to work it and how to play with it and how to mould it so that they can create the life they desire, but they deserve as well. And that's, I guess, my message. That's what this is all about. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to this Financial Standard podcast. For more information, visit financialstandard.com.au. Please keep in mind that the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider personal circumstances. Reliance should not be placed on any content without further independent financial research and advice. 